two techniques to search for axions and axial-like particles. This meeting is being recorded. So the, <clears throat> should I start over? Okay. So the QCD axion is a gold symposium. Uh, I mean, uh, erased after the spontaneous breaking of the beach queen symmetry, uh, which introduced to solve the strong CB problem by explaining the smallness of the neutron electric dipole moment. And just a few words about the strong CB problem. It is the problem of the absence of the CB vibration from nature, or simply it question uh, why the vacuum angle theta, it, uh, it is so small. And uh, <clears throat> if axions are exist, their potential should uh, dynamically promote theta to be zero and solve the strong CB problem. Axion-like particles are similar particles uh, to, this, uh, strong, uh, to the QCD uh, axion uh, introduced to solve other fundamental problems using the same beach queen uh, method. And they are sharing the same phenomenology with the QCD axion, which is determined by the high energy scale at which the symmetry is spontaneously broken. Uh, because of this high energy scale, all their interactions with standard model particles are suppressed. And because of this reason, plus that they can uh, form the total abundance of the dark matter, they seem to be very suitable candidates for the dark matter. The common interactions between axial-like particles and uh, QCD axions is their interactions with photons, which uh, determine by this coupling G uh, between axions and photons. Most of the search, the current search, is looking to uh, uh, I mean, parameterize the axion mass and the axion coupling with photons, and there is a bunch of experiments. We have upper bound on the axion mass. It shouldn't be uh, greater than a few electron volts because uh, they, in such a case, they will not form the total abundance of the dark matter, and they cannot be uh, lighter than 10 to negative 22 because they cannot be dark matter in such a case. Uh, we have upper bound on the, on the coupling come from the cost experiments around few times 10 to negative 11 GV inverse. And there is near future experiments like the Alp second and the Axio and many others trying to scan the parameter space area up to 10 to negative 16 GV inverse for the coupling. We also have very good news from the ADMX experiments around this area. Uh, their sensitivity already reached the uh, the, the yellow region for the QCD axion around the microelectron volt uh, scale. And that makes us expect within the next few years to hear uh, very good news about axions from their side. And the first part of my work, I was uh, focusing on studying the axion conversion from, um, to photons uh, using or inside the astrophysical environment of the jet of the M87 active galactic uh, nucleus. And uh, for this interaction to happen, it required the existing, uh, I mean, it required a background of magnetic field which exists within the jet of the active galactic nuclei. And in this model, we consider relativistic axions. And those equations are just uh, the Klein Jordan equation for the axion field coupled with the Maxwell equations for the electromagnetic uh, field. And by solving this system, we can get the two polarization component for the photon field and calculate the conversion probability. Our contribution to this, uh, to this work, uh, we consider the case when there is a misalignment between our line of sight and the jet axis. And on the such, we use the geometry in this case to uh, argue that the maximum conver conversion should happen when the, when the misalignment angle is so close to the value of the opening angle of the jet. And that's simply because if you consider the misalignment, this will be the way for the axion uh, beam to move the longest distance diagonally inside the jet. Then we tried all the possible cases for the, the misalignment uh, angle and the opening angle for the jet uh, suggested on the literature just to test our model. Then we consider our modified model to calculate the total energy spectrum for the M87. And that's for, this is just the power spectrum for um, using different misalignment angles. And for each case, we make sure that our, uh, our results match with the observations. 
Then for each case, we got the uh, uh, upper bound on the, on the coupling. And since the most motivated value for the opening angle for the MT7 from literature, uh, that it's equal four degrees, and it is misaligned by something less than 20 degrees, we got this uh, limit on the coupling. Then we compare our model by a model put by Colon to explain the coma clusters of X-ray axis based on the, on the conversion from, axio, uh, from axions to photons. And since they are using um, stronger coupling than ours and using the same model, we argue that their model should overproduce the emission for the, emitted, for the, for the coma cluster. And for a better explanation, we suggest to use our new constraint for this model. Oh, yeah, sure. So one, minute. one minute. Well, very quickly, on the second part, I was um, looking to calculate the radio emissions can be produced from the axion decay. And axion can spontaneously decay with lifetime larger than the current age of the universe. And we cannot count on this interaction to produce any observable signal. But since axions are bosons, they are very light, and they can be exist with very high occupation number, like what Stoffa said. Uh, they can form uh, uh, bose einstein condensates, and those can thermalize to uh, make axion clumps. And in such a scenario, the stimulated decay uh, is possible with effective uh, decay rate determined by this formula, where the term between the brackets is the enhancement factor. Then we um, estimate the value for the enhancement factors uh, using contribution from the cosmic microwave background plus the contribution from the galactic uh, diffusion emission for uh, selected astrophysical targets plus uh, contribution from the extra galactic uh, background. Then we use that to solve the equation of motion. I'll try just to summarize in, in, in half a minute. We solve the equation of motion considering those enhancement factors and we calculate the emission compared to the sensitivity for the Mericat and the SKA. Uh, unfortunately, those flux are quite lower, but instead, the non-observation of these signals can put some bounds on, on the coupling. On the case of the Mericat, they are comparable to the current limit for the cost, but they are a little bit weaker. But fortunately, on the case of the SKA, they, are, they exceed the current limit for the cost, and they, are, uh, they can be comparable to the potential limit for the ALP second experiment and the axial experiment, which um, argue that the radio telescopes can play an uh, implementary role in scanning the parameter space for axions. It can help the experiments on, on, on doing that. Uh, well, that's uh, all what I want to say. I'll leave you with my conclusion, and thanks a lot. Okay, so a question. You discuss limits from conversion of relativistic axions yeah, into they photons. Are relativistic, of where course. are the, where are these axions coming from? The and how do you and how do you know their abundance? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, let me. What I'm doing something wrong. So they are relativistic axions uh, uh, produced by the decay of the uh, string theory moduli, and their energy should be between. Uh, 0.1 and 1 kilo electron volt. And the, the value we used in, uh, on our model is 0.15 kilo electron volt. What? I'm just doing something wrong. Yeah. So uh, in, in this model, we use rel relativistic axioms. Yeah, because you put a limit on the coupling, but there is a lot of uncertainty because there is uncertainty on the abundance. I mean, yes, the, the, there is some parameters uh, uh, still include uncertainty. Uh, you can speak also about the mag magnetic field. We tried to, to pick the, the, the most acceptable values, and we try our best to produce something. So, there's so the relativistic axions should also, I mean, they're dark radiation, so should, do, you cons do you include the limits from ineffective on these things? Yes, but we didn't consider this in, in, in this model. Yeah, I mean, you, you're right. There are some people considering that, but we didn't consider it in our model. Because that, that should also limit the population. Oh, of course, yeah. sure. Thanks. Any question from Zoom? No? OK. So thanks, Ahmed, for your thanks. talk. You can proceed with.
time. This will go okay. over, turn back, and uh, you have seven minutes. <laughs> Which one is the previous one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Orkojit. Uh, I'm from India. Uh, today, I will be talking about feebly interacting dark matter and a little bit about baryon asymmetry. And I will try to show whether there are any connection with uh, most pop uh, one of the most popular mechanism in neutrino mass generation, which is the seesaw mechanism. So let's start. So as we have already know that uh, there is, there, from various experimental evidences, that there exists dark matter. And they have a finite amount of relic density. They are massive. They are stable objects. One can think, uh, looking at these properties, one can think this dark matter as a fundamental particle. And if one think them as a, if one think this dark matter as a fundamental particle, then there are some unanswered questions which still we do not know what is the answer of them. Like what is the nature of the part dark matter, whether it is a fermion or whether it is a boson, what is the interaction with standard model inter uh, field, and what is the production mechanism in the early universe. We also don't know that, uh, we also know that uh, there are no standard model particles which satisfies the, all the properties we, which we know from uh, the observations. So one need to go beyond standard model of particle physics to uh, to satisfy all uh, to accommodate the dark matter. There is another problem in our universe, which is that our universe is solely a, a baryonic uh, baryon asymmetric universe, which is quantified uh, generally quantified from this y b quantity, which is nothing but the ratio between n b number density of baryon minus number density of anti baryon by the entropy uh, density, and we from to to different experiments, uh, to different uh, different uh, reg regime from CMB and so from BBN, we are getting mm, a constraint on this YB, which are quite similar. So it indeed telling us that are, we are living in a baryon asymmetric universe. So one can now question whether we can generate a baryon asymmetric universe from a baryon symmetric universe. Hello? Yeah. yeah no. Okay. So, Shakarov give us some conditions which can, uh, by using which we can generate the sufficient amount of baryon asymmetry, uh, which are C, C and CPU violation, baryon number violation, and out of equilibrium decay. But we also don't know that the within, if we want to work within the standard model framework, we will not be able to generate baryon asymmetry. So, one again need to go beyond standard model. So, what we ask is that what is the minimal possibility or simplest possibility to bring all these pro unknowns together? So type 1 CISO mechanism can be one of the possibility. So what is type 1 CISO? This is a very popular mechanism from neutrino mass where we add three right-handed neutrinos and we write the, with the uh, along with standard model particles, we write the general, most general Lagrangian with that. What happened is after spontaneous symmetry breaking, neutrino get, uh, we get a neutrino mass matrix, we diagonalize that mass matrix, we get the neutrino mass. This is the uh, formula for neutrino mass, and we are seeing that. Uh, so, so you see that why it's called CISO because here it is like M n is in the denominator. So if we have a very large M n, we can get we can generate a small M n, a small neutrino mass with this formula. So th that's why so something very small is um, determine uh, something very big is determining something very small, which is this small neutrino mass. The same mechanism also. I'm sorry, generate a new concept, which is the active sterile neutrino mixing, which is quantized by this V, which is MD MN inverse. Now, the same type one CISO mechanism also helps us to generate sufficient amount of baryon asymmetry via lepton, leptogenesis mechanism, where you see I have written the same Lagrangian here. So you see this Y nu is a comp in general a complex matrix, so it can be a CP uh, source of CP violation. This Majorana mass term is a lepton number source of lepton number violation and out of equilibrium decay of right-handed neutrino can be shown if we compare with the decay rate with Hubble. So in this way, we can generate a sufficient amount of lepton asymmetry, which can be converted to baryon asymmetry via Spheleron processes. 
So now what we ask is that we see that type 1 CSO can generate neutrino mass. It can also generate baryon asymmetry. Whether that same mechanism can generate the dark, uh, explain the dark existence of dark matter. So for what? What we ask is that we added three right-handed neutrino for neutrino mass generation. Whether one of the right-handed neutrino can be our dark matter. So then more, the next issue is that dark matter should be a stable object. So if let's say my lightest right-handed neutrino to be uh, uh, dark matter, if it has to be stable, the interaction column should be exactly zero. But then it is a very ideal situation. Then dark matter cannot be produced by any standard model interaction. It may produce from uh, gravitation, but uh, we are not in including here. So this is a problematic scenario. So what we propose is that can this lightest right-handed neutrino be a feebly interacting massive particle with a coupling very small of the order 10 to the minus 10. And we go one step ahead and we ask whether that small coupling be connected to a, uh, can we explain the small coupling very naturally or can it be connected with smallness of the neutrino mass? So what we have done, we perturb this uh, uh, interaction column of this uh, smallest right-handed neutrino with a small um, numbers, let's say epsilon 1, epsilon 2 and epsilon 3 and we want to show that whether it is connected, uh, can, we, can the small number be connected with the small neutrino mass? So indeed we can do that, we have to use a parameterization, so it is called Kasa Sivara parameterization. The summary of this slide is that we, uh, using this parameterization, you can show that my small epsilons is connected with the small lightest neutrino mass, M1. And also, outcome of this is that the active stellar neutrino mixing of this lightest neutrino will be also, one minute, okay, sir, uh, will be proportional to the small M1. So now let's see what can we do. So these active stellar neutrino mixing can help us to get uh, production, uh, various production channels of this dark matter. So what we did after spontaneous symmetry breaking, neutrino will get mass. And if you write the gauge interaction and Yoko interaction in this mass diagonal basis, you will see these type of uh, production channels will pop up. And all these production channels are related to these active stellar neutrino mixing angles. So you see, uh, using these production channels, we can solve the Boltzmann, uh, sorry, we can. Uh, Boltzmann equations and uh, from there we get this plot. So here in y-axis we have plotted this number density to uh, entropy ratio and in the x-axis we have plotted the uh, dimensionless quantity z. And what it is saying that, that initially our dark matter, there were no dark matter and because of this w and z decay, dark matter is start to produce and uh, for a large value of z, we are getting uh, uh, a saturated y-n value. From this yn, we can calculate the correct, uh, for a large value of z, we can calculate what is the relic abundance of n1. And from this plot, we also infer that the main production is coming from w and z decay. We also infer with little bit of calculation that this uh, relic density, uh, de and dark matter relic, is independent of its mass. It only depends on the new lightest new new active neutrino mass, and we have found that the lightest active neutrino mass of the order of 10 to the minus 12 EV will uh, generate uh, the sufficient amount of dark matter. Same active sterile neutrino mixing can also uh, help this dark matter to one, one, one. <laughs> <laughs> decay. One, two slides. If you pass it, then there is no limit. Uh. So, so sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, one second, one second, sorry. It's all right, over. So same uh, active sterile neutrino mixing will also uh, help the dark matter to decay. So there are various possible channels. But the most stringent will, channel will come from this N1 going to radiative decay process of right-handed neutrino. Each, and if you calculate the decay rate, it will, you see that it will also related to these mixing angles. So, so one can search for these photons and try to find whether there, there is a photons in the universe. So that also put a bound on these uh, active stellar mixing angles. So you see the light blue region is excluded because non-observance of these X-rays. And this magenta line, what we have found, is uh, satisfying the correct relic abundance for our scenario. So from here, you are easily seeing that this M1 of the below 1 MeV is allowed region, which can be a feebly interacting dark matter. Lower bound we have found from the structure formation, which is uh, Tarmangain bound with 1 keV. So we, have, we can say that dark matter with 1 keV to 1 MeV range can be a feebly interacting dark matter. Other two right-handed neutrinos can be used for leptogenesis, which I am not talking about. So ultimately, what I am trying to say is that type 1 CSO itself provides the most minimal platform to explain the neutrino mass, dark matter, as well as baryogenesis. And that's all, yeah. Sorry for, and sorry for the... Sorry.
Any question from the audience? No? From Zoom, maybe? Does this mean feeble interactions with W and Z uh, do not spoil BBN constraint? No. The interaction is very small. The interaction strength is very small, so it will not affect. No other questions? Then, thank you again. The next talk is by Eleonora Van Zandt. Uh, okay. So, how does work? Okay. Grazie. All right. So, uh, hi everyone. I am Eleonora from Padova, and uh, my project here. Uh, wait, wait. Sorry. My project here focuses on uh, a particular candidate for uh, dark matter, ultralight axion fields, whereby ultralight, I mean in uh, this mass range, so about 10 to the minus 19, 10 to the minus 21 electron volts, and this, uh, as was uh, uh, just discussed in the seminar earlier, this uh, naturally provides uh, a solution for one of the puzzles in the cold dark matter model, uh, that is, it uh, naturally washes out uh, power on uh, small scales, so on the scales that are comparable to the uh, genes length of the field we are talking about. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, is termed fuzzy dark matter, or sometimes also wave dark matter. Um, this is the uh, set of equations that we were writing down yesterday. Uh, you can see that they look exactly like the uh, cold dark matter equations, except for the appearance of this term here. So this term has its uh, uh, roots in uh, quantum pressure of the ultralight field, and it acts uh, as some effective sound speed of, uh, of the action. Therefore, it, uh, uh, it completely washes out, it washes out uh, in power on scales, uh, uh, on case that are larger than the genes length of, uh, of the particle. This is a plot just to appreciate the, 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 the difference between uh, various uh, mass ranges for the action. So as you can see, the lightest, uh, uh, the lightest particles wash out uh, uh, more power. So the idea is to uh, look for the uh, suppression on very small scales, and it is convenient to go to the dark ages because uh, things remain uh, linear up to uh, small scales because essentially you have no uh, astrophysical complications entering the game. And the powerful uh, probe in the near future will be 21 centimeter line intensity mapping. So uh, for, uh, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with, uh, with line intensity mapping, uh, the, the basic idea is uh, uh, you select the, the frequency, the 21 centimeter uh, spin flip of the hydrogen atom, and uh, uh, this gets uh, diluted, uh, uh, this gets uh, redshifted by the expansion of the universe. Therefore, you can do tomography. It's as if uh, you had a lot of CMB screens, uh, each at a different uh, redshift uh, slice. And this allows you to probe uh, the dark ages where we are uh, essentially blind right now. Uh, so the, uh, what I've been doing is uh, uh, essentially uh, a Fisher forecast to look for this uh, uh, suppression at the very high, uh, uh, the highest multiples in the angular power spectrum of 21 centimeter intensity mapping. Um, at this stage, uh, you can see uh, this is a very uh, futuristic uh, lunar uh, radio array experiment. So uh, what we can do is look for a, a smarter uh, effect that will allow us to see, um, to see some imprint at lower uh, multiples. So let me take a step back and talk about uh, relative velocity between variance and dark matter at the time of recombination. So right before recombination, uh, baryons uh, uh, traveled together uh, with photons, while cold dark matter, or dark matter in general, simply followed the geodesics and uh, uh, created its, uh, its potential wells, because uh, it, did not, uh, it did not talk to photons. Uh, therefore, there was a relative velocity between the two, and at recombination, when, uh, when baryons uh, uh, decouple from the photon fluid, uh, they do not uh, immediately uh, realize that there are the gravitational potential wells. So this kind of delays the growth of structure, 
and uh, this uh, suppresses uh, power too on the scales where the uh, relative velocity effect uh, is important. This is a picture just to summarize everything. So uh, the dashed lines are without uh, taking into uh, account for the relative velocity effect, while solid lines do. And uh, as you can see, there is a suppression. Uh, the, um, the black lines here are the usual cold dark matter model, while the, uh, the light blue lines are the, the models with the ultralight action. Now, um, you can imagine that uh, at recombination, uh, the universe was uh, uh, divided in many uh, patches, and in each of these regions, uh, the relative velocity had a slightly different background value. Therefore, uh, your power spectrum gets uh, modulated on the scales uh, over which the relative velocity uh, varies, and this leads, uh, in other words, to a, a long-short mode coupling that enhances the power on uh, small scales. And we can use this effect to, to search for an enhancement at the lowest uh, multiples in the 21 centimeter uh, angular power spectrum. You see that there is a relative, co co a relative correction at low else due to this uh, uh, long short mod coupling. So this uh, uh, hopefully will allow us to, uh, to appreciate uh, the effect of ultralight uh, uh, action fields uh, with more uh, um, realistic uh, uh, surveys. And uh, well, this is still a work in progress, so <laughs> I do not have uh, results yet for the second order effects. Uh, do I still have a lot of time? <laughs> no, <laughs> it's strange. OK, so uh, I don't know, do, do you have a, I thank you for your attention. <laughs> Are there questions? I missed it perhaps, but what, what mass will you be able to constrain using this? Like so I'm looking at the 10 to the minus uh, uh, 21, uh, 19 uh, mass range, uh, which is a very delicate one because uh, uh, Lyman alpha constraints are closing it uh, from one side, uh, and then you have uh, 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 black hole super radiance that is closing it on the other side. So essentially what remains is around 10 to the minus 19 uh, electron volts. I, so, so there is a I, I think I forgot to mention it, but there is a recent paper by Delal and Krautsov that seem to constrain the mass to be bigger than three times 10 to the minus 19 EV. So okay. this is based on uh, stellar, based on velocity dispersion in uh, ultra, ultra faint dwarf galaxies. So they're trying, essentially, so they're, at least the claim is that the mass has to be bigger than three times 10 to the minus 19 EV. So it might be worth looking into that yeah, uh, as well to see. Uh, well, that would still, uh, would still be in, uh, in the range where uh, uh, the, the effect <coughs> of uh, axion uh, suppression and uh, relative velocity mm -hmm. suppression are more or less in the same uh, so, range. Yeah. Uh, well, usually in uh, in 21 centimeter, you look for the for the CLs as if you as you do in the in CMB physics, uh, basically. I, I don't maybe I didn't understand your question. Uh, well, because I know that often also the solidarity or the uh, sparity average power spectrum is used. I was wondering uh, if there was a specific reason why you chose the angular power spectrum. Mm. Well, when you, when you do the forecast, you assume that uh, uh, you look for redshift beams that are, uh, uh, that are not uh, that are independent, basically. And so you, you sum the information on every redshift slice. But uh, uh, what, uh, what happens typically is that the, the first uh, redshift uh, slices contain the most information. So since you're probing larger values of K, what I understand is the 21 centimeter initial, at least, detections will be used to probe large scale, so small K. So do you yes. worry that by going to larger K, the 21 centimeter power spectrum, its, its relation to the dark matter power spectrum may not be very simple? 
uh, well, uh, since uh, uh, th that it's not uh, linear anymore, you mean? That For example, so I may not be able to think of the 21 centimeter power spectrum as a simple multiple of the dark matter power spectrum anymore. Well, it, it should, uh, uh, for, for the bias, you mean? You can think of it in terms of bias, but it's not clear which scales you plan to probe, no? because this will depend on the mass that you're trying to constrain. So. Yes, well, if I look at the first order effects only, uh, we are at a multiple of about uh, 10 to the 6, uh, uh, even larger, which is uh, uh, really high. So it will be the target of very futuristic experiments. But hopefully, if you account for a second order relative velocity effects, uh, uh, they would leave an imprint on, on more realistic, uh, smaller multiples. OK, so Merdad, do we have any questions from Zoom? Okay, so thank you again. Okay, thanks. So the next speaker is Beatriz Turci. And so here you are. Hi everyone, I'm Beatrice Tucci. I'm currently a PhD student working with Fabian Schmidt there at Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics. But today I'll be talking about a work that I've been developing during my undergrad and masters, which is called The Spin Bios of Dark Matter Halos. And I did this in collaboration with Raul Abramo and Antonio Monteiro Dorta, their University of Sao Paulo. So here's an outline of my talk. I will first introduce what secondary bias is, then I will go over low mass and high mass spin bias. I will briefly comment how we can probe spin bias in observations, and I'll give you the conclusions. So we have been studying in the large scale structure course the distribution of matter particles, and we know that on the top of that we have the distribution of dark matter halos and galaxies, and we call these objects cosmological tracers of this underlying matter distribution. And of course, these objects differ one from another in several properties, such as mass, size, age, spin, and so on. And we can, uh, we can connect the distribution of these cosmological tracers that are, what we, that are what we actually observe in the sky to the distribution of matter with the so-called bias expansion. And we can write it, it by considering all the relevant operators at each order. And uh, it's very important for us to understand this connection via the bias parameters because they encode a lot of information on the physics. And it has been known for a long time that halo bias depends primarily on halo mass. So they ha uh, basically for the linear bias, the highest is the mass of the halo, the highest is its linear bias. However, it, ha it has been shown in numerical and body simulations that actually at a fixed mass, actually the halo bias also depends on several secondary halo properties, such as age, concentration, spin, and so on. So here in this plot, for example, if we take like for a fixed halo mass and we separate the halos into the oldest and younger halos, we see that there is a, sorry, there is a difference in bias between them. So the oldest halos here have a higher relative bias than the youngest halos. And this, this trend uh, kind of decreases with halo mass. Um, and uh, actually to this day, we do not have like a, an agreement in the literature, I would say, about observational evidence of uh, secondary bias. And also, we do not have like, a complete analytical framework to account for all these trends. And that's where my work comes in. So perhaps the most well-studied case of uh, secondary bias is assembly bias, which is the secondary dependence of halo clustering on the uh, assembly history of halos. And we can actually parameterize the assembly history of halos with, for example, its age or its concentration. And here is a plot like, of a, a slice of a simulation where we took the halos of a fixed mass and we separated the halos into more and less concentrated. And you can see that these two population of halos, differ, uh, they populate different regions of the cosmic web. So these halos are like in more dense regions here. And this reflects the fact that these halos have different bias. Okay. And, but in this talk, I'll be focusing on spin bias, which is the secondary dependence of halo clustering on spin, 
that is basically a dimensionless quantity related to the halo angular momentum. And we can see here in this figure that we can separate spin bias in two regimes. So in the low mass end, we see that low spin halos have a higher bias than high spin <coughs> halos, while the opposite is true for the uh, high mass end, right? So I'm basically, I'll be basically trying to uh, understand what is happening here in this figure. So for the low mass spin bias, what we found is that this, uh, this inversion of the trend at the low mass end can be completely uh, explained by a very specific population of halos called splashback halos. So splashback halos are distinct halos at the present redshift that we are analyzing, but that previously have passed inside the viewer radius of another halo. So they are X sub halos. And as you can imagine, most of these halos still live near the uh, they are previous hosts, so they uh, kind of inherit the large-scale bias properties of these halos. So usually these halos have a higher bias than other halos of similar mass. And also, um, so here is just for, uh, to show you, we measure the spin bias in several redshifts and for several uh, halo masses. And what we saw is that after removing this very specific population of splashback halos that are usually like 10% of the population depending on their mass range, the, uh, the low mass inversion completely disappeared. So, uh, and the physical reason for why these uh, splashback halos drive the low mass spin bias resolution is that when these halos pass inside the viral radius of another halo, they suffer from intense tidal stripping due to tidal interactions with this host. And this tidal stripping, besides from decreasing halo mass, it also decreases halo angular momentum. And one of the theories for that is that because by removing the outer particles of the halo, which have uh, a higher angular momentum, you are decreasing the halo angular momentum as well. And so here's just a wrap up, right? So uh, first of all, uh, splashback halos naturally have a spin by a higher bias because they live near these massive X hosts. Uh, they also have a lower spin because when they pass inside these X hosts, they suffer from tense tidal stripping. And also, they are more important in low masses in recent times, which is also true for this low mass spin bias inversion that we were observing. Okay, now that we uh, understood what is happening in this region here, we can turn out and uh, ask ourselves why high spin halos have a higher bias than low spin halos at the high mass range. And uh, it's very good that we are in the high mass, uh, in the high mass end because now we can use uh, analytical tools of halo formation, so, such as the, the peak formalism and exclusion sets. And with these tools, we can in principle predict analytically the, uh, the bias dependence of halos with their uh, secondary properties, such as the spin. And what, uh, what has been shown in this uh, seminal paper here is that for uh, if you take the halos in the present redshift and you trace them back to the initial conditions, usually you're gonna find that they are formed in, uh, in peaks of the initial density field. And uh, it has been shown that for a fixed peak height, the halos uh, with uh, different curvature have different bias. So halos with shallower curvature usually have a higher bias than halos of a sharper curvature. And it has been shown in this paper that for the high mass assembly bias, actually uh, uh, halos of a lower concentration also are formed from shallower peaks, what would in principle explain why they have a higher bias than uh, higher concentration halos at a fixed mass. So uh, it has been shown also in this paper that the angular momentum can be also related to the curvature. So in principle, uh, both uh, effects could be uh, originated from the same physical mechanism. And also we can think about uh, spin bias in the exclusion set peak uh, formalism. And basically, if we take the initial uh, density of these halos, uh, we can see that for a fixed halo mass, the scattering their initial density is correlated with their, uh, with their initial shear. And we also know that the initial shear is correlated to the uh, halo angular momentum with the tidal torque theory. So in principle, we can also use this barrier here to uh, derive the, the bias dependence on the spin of the halos uh, for a given mass. And these are just some preliminary results where I measured the uh, initial curvature and uh, initial uh, density of halos uh, by separating them in spin, and we can see that it, they are formed from shallower peaks and also they have a higher initial curvature and a higher initial uh, density. And just to uh, show you uh, an interesting work that we did, 
that we can actually probe this spin bias in uh, real data in principle by using the kinetic sonayev zeldovich effect uh, to trace the halo angular momentum in such a way that we can in principle separate halos in higher and lower spin and uh, try to recover the signal in, in, uh, in observations. And that's it, thank you. Questions from the audience? So I wonder, you said in principle, but uh, is it something that uh, can right. work? Because so, uh, this yes. in principle, I didn't understand. We have measured in illustrious TNG, which is our uh, hydrodynamical simulations, uh, which we believe that they, uh, they explain like the, the distribution of galaxies as well. So for us to really have uh, uh, a, good, a good model for that, we would have to carefully test how would be the signal to noise ratio and do a more careful analysis and then apply to real data with, uh, uh, with clusters and so on. But the problem is that nowadays we have very few clusters with uh, the KSD signal, so uh, it's, it would be only a, a thing that you do in the future. Sorry if I m miss this, but the recent paper is about spin-off filaments as well. Yes. So how does your, can you t tell us a little bit about what's the update on that and does your work connect to that? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, I think the spin-off filaments can't be explained by thylotorc theory, if I'm not mistaken, what, what I heard uh, there. So I think this would be a bit different. I can use thylotorc theory. And uh, all my work has been focused on halos for now, but of course I could try to to at least see simulations how, uh, how this happens for filaments and try to think of possible explanations, even see if a fixed mass of filaments, I can see a different, I don't know, a different bias because filaments are, are also tracers. Uh, I have a question. Uh, is there any correlation between mass and spin? Uh, yes, yes, there is a correlation. But actually, uh, the distribution of spin is kind of independent of mass. So if you plot, for example, the mean spin as a function of mass, you see almost a constant. There is very small tilt only. Okay. So thanks again. <laughs> Next speaker is... Uh, Prem Vijay Velmani. Okay, uh, I'm here. Myself, Premija Velmani from the Inter-University Science Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics. Uh, I'm going to talk about my recent work on how the galaxy formation affects the dark matter halos. Uh, enough of information has been said about the dark matter halos in the lectures and this previous talk. So I can skip through the introduction. So basically, uh, most of the uh, properties of the nature of the dark matter halos have been studied through gravi gravitational uh, only simulations. However, this uh, formation of galaxy within those halos can also strongly impact those halos. So we are interested in particular that aspect. So how we study is that primarily using this hydrodynamical simulations uh, where the baryonic processes uh, that, uh, that are underlying this astrophysical uh, various processes like star formation, cooling and all this stuff. So those things are incorporated as uh, subgrade uh, uh, prescriptions. So for example, this, uh, this Eagle project, so this you can see that it simulates a cosmological volume in that if you zoom into a small patch, uh, 
the, you can see that there are galaxies in so we use such simulations like eagle and uh, there is another sort of simulations hydrodynamical simulations illustris tng in those simulations we choose we also use their corresponding gravity only runs where the same initial density field has been evolved but uh, switching off all the baryonic physics so then we take the halos from the, uh, this corresponding uh, simulations and match them by looking at their initial protopaths in the initial density field Use, and after matching them uh, for example uh, uh, here it is shown the uh, one halo from elastic change and another uh, one randomly chosen halo from the eagle so we can see that in the left panel the same halo in the uh, hydrodynamical run with full baryonic physics is distinctly different from the same halo in the uh, gravity only run uh, we can easily note that the halo in the hydrodynamical is more spherical and uh, it's also uh, somewhat more compact if you can notice uh, actually this uh, uh, differences have been studied over the last two decades but initially they have been looking at through uh, more individual halo simulations now with the availability of cosmological simulation we can study this effects in more statistical sense we focus on in particular the uh, change in the, uh, the compactification of the halo or like what we call the relaxation of the dark matter content in response to the galaxy formation so physically this has been usually the, uh, understood in terms of uh, adiabatic invariance one of the simple model is by this uh, blumenthal et al where they uh, make an ideal assumption of uh, spherical symmetry perfect angular momentum conservation for the dark matter particle orbits so that uh, and, uh, and also assuming no sh uh, shell crossing so that if we uh, were to look at the same halo with the before the galaxy formation and after the galaxy formation the change in the dark matter particle orbits will be given by the change in the total mass enclosed by that uh, yeah, uh, spherical shell in which that particular dark matter particle is present so this give, this gives a simple relation for the uh, change in the particle uh, orbit radius rf by ri where rf is the final radius after the galaxy formation so here there is a terminology one th that when we say after relaxation and before relaxation it, it can it is equivalent to saying that we are looking at the halo in the uh, hydrodynamical run with the ga galaxy formation and the ha another gravity only run where we switch off all the baryon physics and uh, use only gravity so that is considered as the unrelaxed halo and the halo in the hydrodynamical run we consider as the relaxed halo so this produces a simple relation for this relaxation ratio r of r i in terms of the mass ratio here mi of r i is the total mass and en uh, enclosed within the shell in the uh, gravity only halo and mf of rf is the total mass enclosed within the corresponding shell where the dark matter enclosed is uh, where the dark matter is mdf rf is same as the in, uh, dark matter enclosed in the initial shell but the total mass is changed because the baryons would have either moved in or moved out of the shell so generalizing such, such adiabatic uh, relaxation models gives uh, relaxation relation of this form that rf by ri in terms of uh, some function of mass ratio but what we find is that if we try to come uh, exact such relaxation relation in using this uh, uh, hydrodynamical simulations this illustris tng and eagle we find that there is a wide variation in the relaxation relation with mass for example in the first panel we show that even within a uh, so say let's look at this one this is the, for the halos of mass 10 power 12 let's inverse mc halos so even this individual lines correspond for single halo and the thick line and the thick uh, markers correspond to a average behavior of the relaxation relation but, uh, while there is a wide variation in the relaxation relation uh, across the halos in the given mass there is a strong difference uh, if you notice both the this x x axis range that uh, the relaxation the average relaxation relation behavior also strongly change which uh, in this behavior will be more obvious so using the three different uh, uh, boxes of the elastic tng simulation we were able to uh, exact the relaxation relation information across a wide range of halo masses so here the color is denoted by this for example the darkest the black one corresponds to the cluster scale halos of 10 power 14 h inverse mcn halos and uh, the this red ones are of the very dwarf galaxy halos so we see that there is a wide range of uh, relaxation on my so wide range of uh, uh, differences in the relaxation relation but 
even even though this is consistent with the result from the eagle what however it turns out that this is not really telling about the uh, differences in the relaxation with mass because we find that if we suppose take the relaxation relation at fixed lax radii across different halos in a given uh, set of sample suppose i am taking 100 halos in a selected by certain criteria then i calculate at a uh, then i say that this at i am looking at this relax radii and then calculate the relaxation ratio and the mass ratio and then uh, make a function of this R uh, relaxation ratio as a function of mass ratio, then we find a very simple relation for which, uh, back, not going back, okay, yes. So for this relation, uh, if suppose we were to restrict ourselves to the particular lux radii, then this is giving a linear relation for the chi. So then we look at that uh, with the linear model, we look at other halos. So here we show for a variety of different uh, halos at different mass scales. And we see that at all the diff uh, mass scales that we considered and at different radii that we are considering, the relation between the mass ratio, uh, mass ratio and the laxity ratio is very well described by a linear uh, relation. So here, if suppose if we were to take that uh, slope of that relation and uh, uh, intercept that Q1 is the slope and Q0 being the intercept, and we take, plot it as a function of the final lax radii, then we find that now the, uh, these two parameters, which completely captures the relaxation uh, behavior, is much more similar across the different halo masses. This is in strong contrast to what we saw initially that the global uh, relaxation relation was very different uh, with different halo mass. So, so this is what the, uh, so then we see that if, if we, we can even further simplify this, this uh, relation, uh, relation between this relaxation behavior with radius. It's not appearing. Yes, so this uh, Q1 as a function of R and Q0 as a function of R, if we focus on those halo masses less than 10 power 13 H inverse Mson, then we see that the Q, Q1, that slope, is a very uh, more, monotonically increasing and it's also very uh, linearly uh, increasing with respect to the log radius. And the Q0 parameter, which represents offset, is roughly constant for such uh, low mass halos. So we try to make a simplified three parameter model to capture the relaxation relation is this So this model which has this Q10, Q11, and Q0 with three parameters, this can capture the relaxation relation for all the halos except for the cluster scale halos. So using, so just look at, looking at the physics for this uh, uh, Q0 parameter, because Q1 has been previously looked at in the literature, but this Q0 is something which uh, is saying something weird, because if the relaxation ratio is, uh, less than one, even when the mass ratio is equal to one. Be uh, what this means is that for a shell, when the total mass uh, enclosed by the shell is remaining same, but still there is some relaxation. So how we can understand is that equally we can also think of this as that when the relaxation ratio is equal to one, that is there is no relaxation, but still some mass has, uh, the total mass enclosed is changed. So this could be possibly, uh, this could be because the <coughs> baryonic feedback has pushed some of the baryon mass away so that the final uh, total mass enclosed is lower than the initial, so that the Mi by Mf is greater than one. But to test this further, we need to study the uh, how this relaxation changes with respect to the halo properties. I will, yes, I will, uh, I will go, go to the final result that I want to show. This, uh, <laughs> this one's, uh, I'm going to the conclusion. No, I'm just going to talk. So, we can discuss. So, please, any question from the audience? No? From Zoom, maybe? No, nothing. Then, I don't know. Thanks again, first of all. Thank and, you. Uh, We're going to have a five minutes break before the next uh, presentation. Oh, thank you.
Is uh, Sonia Ornella Schobesberger, please. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, welcome. Good afternoon. My name is. Uh, okay. Did I do that? No, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, second try. So, yeah, my name is Sonia. I'm in my first year of uh, my PhD. And I'm happy to present to you a paper I contributed to at the beginning, um, titled Analytical Growth Functions for Cosmic Structures in the Lambda CDM Universe. And it's going to be centered around basically analytical avenues uh, and predictions to large scale structure of cosmic matter. Um, a lot of the setup is very um, actually closely related to what we learned today and in the past days, so maybe I can keep this short. Uh, essentially, all of this is about the non linear large scale dynamics of cosmic matter. And the idea that we can describe it uh, in the light limits as a phase space distribution. Um, and doing the essential limits, considering exactly like it's a fluid in a weak field, non relativistic and collisionless limit, um, and also um, in a limit where we can actually describe the, all of the um, evolution analytically, namely assuming initially cold and scalar fluids. Um, we arrive at uh, yeah, the maybe familiar uh, by now system of equations, the Euler Poisson equations for cold cosmic matter. Again, uh, the assumption here, and we have learned this already today, is the single stream regime. So it's about vanishing velocity dispersion vorticity. Um, if you linearize the system, also this we have seen today, um, the solution factorizes into a temporal and a spatial part. And, and just so that we know what, it, what we're talking about, um, if we consider the uh, appropriate uh, Friedman equation um, where your fluid is essentially exposed to a uh, constant component of dark energy, the um, yeah, lambda, then the temporal, temporal, um, this, exactly, the temporal part will be given by a hypergeometric function and the spatial part uh, will essentially be given by powers of the gravitational field. Okay, and also this we have seen today, so I will keep it short. Essentially, the basic or main tool to work in all of this is Lagrangian perturbation theory. The change is to switch from density and velocity to a moving um, coordinate system that moves along with the trajectories. These trajectories will eventually meet at a point which is often referred to as shell crossing, and this is when this approach also um, has local breakdown, so to say. The idea is now to evolve or expand the displacement field in the time variable itself. Exactly, and it breaks down at shell crossing. So um, the idea or the purpose of the paper was to find our basically exact uh, growth functions for a lambda CDM um, Friedman equation. Also to analyze different, so to say, summation techni techniques within LPT. Um, why does this matter? So there's, in this context, there's the effort of the community to basically um, forward model this fluid as far as we can um, by analytical tools. So this can be relevant for forward modeling, for effective field descriptions that then have many other applications, or when you consider, for example, massive neutrino cosmologies. Um, so what do they do when they want to forward model? Um, there are approximations to this. So you can, for example, consider the einstein de Sitter friedman equation, solve your displacement field, and then uh, or replace your time variable with the linear growth factor of a lambda CDM model. This is an approximation. Another approach would be, and now we come to a different kind of summation technique, um, sorry, uh, where you don't, so to say, sum or order via time variable or powers in it, but via certain spatial kernels. And if you do that, there are also approximations um, in the form of asymptotic considerations. Famous paper by Boucher of 1995. So and in our paper, we came up um, with a yeah, partly new formalism, the D-time formalism, where we do not discard any couplings between lambda and the matter itself. We um, expand in terms of the refined time variable D itself. 
um, we developed all order recursion relations in order to recursively solve for the coefficients in this expansion. And then uh, developed also a resummation technique to, so to say, arrive from this time um, expansion to this summation in spatial kernels with corresponding growth functions. Um, doing this, uh, the output is basically exact up to a certain, up to, so to say, arbitrary precision, exact uh, growth functions in any order you want, um, which are given by an expression in terms of the refined time arrival. And this is one of the, um, so to say, results you see here. Um, also, these expressions are really fastly converging. That's why I'm talking about exact. So, maybe later, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, Exactly, so we have these developed, also um, um, expanded this to velocity coefficients and calculated uh, one loop power and three level bispectra out of this. So the results are um, for the growth functions that the difference between this exact, so to say, um, predictions for the growth functions and, so to say, the ratio to when you turn off, so to say, the explicit appearance of lambda is um, small for the growth functions, so below uh, 2%. It's up to 4% when we talk about the, the velocity coefficients, so it's a non-negligible effect there. Um, when we talk about power and bispectra, it's an effect that's less than 1%, so mm -hmm, uh, less than 1%, but it shows a scale-dependent power su suppression similar to massive neutrino cosmologies, which could be relevant in um, uh, corresponding um, pipelines. And so to say as a, yeah, as a finish, the take home messages. So now there exist true analytical growth functions in the code limit of a lambda senior universe. Where they're implemented, they're implemented in monophon IC, a initial condition generator. There is a straightforward way to apply and expand or extend these um, techniques to more generic cosmologies. And we highly recommend to yeah, use these growth functions when you talk about forward modeling or also in the context of effective field theories and, for example, um, neutrino cosmologies. Thank you very much. Oh, this is the next one. So this expansion that you had, D and then E, E. Yes. So the coefficients mm -hmm. psi 1, psi 2 are the usual expressions that we calculate in, in perturbation theory? Exactly. So in, in uh, yeah, here, so this would be, so to say, the maybe standard, exactly, perturbative approach it's where like these the psi 1, psi 2. that appears in this. The it's not the side. same, exactly. So maybe, yeah, we should be careful here. So these are the large ones, these are the small ones. Yeah, maybe, yeah, notation is essential here. These are coefficients when you, so to say, sort by the time arrival. So this is, so to say, the new approach. And the standard approach is, so to say, these ones where the size would be the spatial kernels that actually arise from the Jacobian when you think of the Q derivative of psi or um, combinations of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, I don't know if I understood correctly mm -hmm. how the corrections appear, but it seemed to me that the corrections mm -hmm. for the perturbative theory yeah. are after the perturbative theory breaks down, isn't it? I know. Um, okay, so this is an important distinction, right? When this, when the, when the, so to say, the breakdown as soon as shell crossing happens means that none of this is applicable. This is then, yeah, it just rendered meaningless. Um, and this is why I also, so to say, um, um, why I mentioned effective field theories. So what you would do there is you take these approaches and ideally with this formalism because it's highly precise up until any time, um, you would apply, so to say, the best filtering techniques that you have. It can be in Fourier space or other spaces, so I'm working now in other spaces. And then, um, so to say, filter out wherever shell crossing happens and then combine this with other theories that then work afterwards. This is also what was mentioned in the lecture today. So yeah, two different things to consider. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, any question from Zoom? Huh? No? Okay, so thank you again. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next speaker is uh, Ivana Babic.
used to go on and used to go back. Wait, wait, well, ah, yeah. okay, okay. Seven minutes. Okay, uh, so hi everyone, I'm Ivana Babic. I'm currently a PhD student at Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics in Munich. And I will be telling you about this work on the BAO scale inference from bias tracers using the EFT likelihood. So baryon acoustic oscillations are visible as an oscillatory feature in the matter power spectrum. We see them as these wiggles here. And we also see them in the correlation function where we see them as this bump. Now, since the size of the physical scale corresponding to the BAO scale, me measuring its apparent size in the late time matter distribution actually allows us to estimate the angular diameter distance and the Hubble parameter as the function of redshift. But before we can um, apply this method, we have to face two problems. The first problem is that matter evolved nonlinearly. And the second one is that we don't even observe directly the evolved matter density field, but what we observe are the bias tracers of this field. And the um, distribution of these uh, bias tracers is uh, affected by the highly nonlinear structure formation. And this nonlinear structure formation kind of makes our life difficult because it uh, decreases the precision with which we can actually measure the um, BAO scale from the galaxy clustering. Essentially what it does, it reduces, um, it uh, shifts and it dumps down these uh, peak in the correlation function and it erases these uh, high K modes in the, in the power spectrum. And this is why many uh, reconstruction methods for the BAO have been developed, but most of them, they rely on the so-called backward modeling. And we wanted to see how well we can infer BAO using the forward modeling approach. So in forward modeling, we start from the initial phases, so the initial conditions which correspond to the primordial fluctuations, and then we evolve them into the observable structures of the day. And our main, main goal is to find a posterior, a joint posterior, for the initial density field, cosmological parameters, bias parameters, and the stochastic amplitudes. And to find this posterior, we need four, uh, we need four separate ingredients. So the first thing we need is this prior on the initial conditions. And in our case, we assume that these initial conditions are Gaussian, simply because this was predicted by inflation and probed by CMB. And once we have initial conditions, we, we apply some kind of forward model for matter and gravity and combine it with bias expansion just to get the density field of a tracer at the uh, redshift of interest. In our case, uh, we used a third order Lagrangian perturbation theory combined with the third order bias, uh, Lagrangian bias expansion. And finally, uh, we need uh, some likelihood which, should, which will allow us to compare our theoretical prediction to some data. And in our case, uh, the da data came from n-body simulations. We used rest frame uh, halo catalogs. This is why in the paper all our uh, results are exp expressed in terms of halos, but this can be uh, applied to any to any other biased uh, tracer just as well. And uh, the fact that we were using simulation kind of ca came in handy to us because it allowed us to fix these uh, initial phases to the exact ones that were used to initialize simulation that was used to find these uh, to find these halos. So all our results are for these fixed initial conditions, and our future work is going to be on varying these initial conditions. And some work uh, is already happening on this in the group. Now, we wanted to constrain BAO scale only from the information available in the oscillatory part of the power spectrum. We didn't want to refer to the broad, uh, broadband part. And we also wanted to be able to change this BAO scale in the initial density field, simply because this feature was imprinted into the matter density field so early into the universe days that it made sense to change it into the initial conditions. And to be able to do this, we started with this uh, approximation, which separates the linear power spectrum into the broadband and into the oscillatory feature. And in this oscillatory feature, we introduce the parameter beta as a ratio of some rescaled BAO scale size to the fiducial uh, BAO scale. So for beta equals to one, we recovered the fiducial value of the BAO scale. And changing then beta changes the BAO scale, but without changing the broad, uh, broadband part, it only changes those uh, wiggles. Just bring some in. And we introduce this function f to be able to apply these changes onto the density of field directly. So essentially what we were doing is we were uh, feeding all these different uh, initial density fields into the forward model. So uh, all the cosmological parameters were the same, but the only difference was into the size of the BAO scale. And finally, the likelihood that we were using is this EFT likelihood. So the most interesting feature of this uh, likelihood is that it works at the level of the field, as you can see here. 
And then this means that uh, it captures all the information at once because it's working with the field, it, it gets the information from the power spectrum, by spectrum, uh, and so on. But to really be able to tell how well this uh, likelihood works, we had to compare it to something. And it was a little bit tricky to find what to compare it to because we fixed these initial conditions. So comparing it to uh, results that are already out there wouldn't really be fair. It would be like comparing uh, apples to oranges. So what we did is we took uh, a standard power spectrum a level likelihood, but we recalculated the covariance to reflect the fact that uh, initial phases are fixed. Therefore, we were able to do a very fair comparison uh, of well, um, apples to apples. And one more thing that is important to mention is that here uh, at this power spectrum level likelihood, we didn't perform any other additional reconstruction. So the input inside uh, was the one that was coming from the forward model, so the same one that was uh, coming from the EFT likelihood. So this is comparison at the, at the level just uh, of the likelihoods. And finally, uh, let's see the results. So we were testing two things. We wanted to see how biased the EFT likelihood is, and we, then we wanted uh, to compare its uh, one sigma. Uh, we wanted to compare one sigma to the power spectrum one, and we see that uh, this likelihood is really unbiased. So bias is actually below two percent across all the redshifts and at whole, uh, across all the halo uh, mass samples that we were using. And if we focus only on these uh, least massive halos, a uh, bias is actually below one uh, percent, which is really good. And maybe the most interesting plot is the one comparing these two likelihoods. And we see that uh, for a very small uh, cutoffs, these two likelihoods have a very similar per performance, which is to be expected because uh, data is uh, close to Gaussian here, so they get the same amount of information. But as the uh, cutoff increases, uh, these nonlinearities become more significant, and the uh, EFT likelihood uh, outperforms the power spectrum likelihood. So finally, for the takeaway, we see that in the case of fixed phases, uh, very, uh, varied phases will come in the future, we see that the re uh, remaining systematic bias for the EFT likelihood is below 1%, and we see that uh, the improvement compared to the power spectrum likelihood is between 1.1 and 3.3, uh, depending on the cutoff lambda. That's it. Thank you very much. Covariance matrix did you use? Sorry, I cannot hear you. What covariance matrix did you use? How did you obtain your covariance matrix? Uh, well, uh, you mean for the uh, you mean for the EFT likelihood case or for the case of the power spectrum one? Because there are two likelihoods. And, um, we, both. Uh, so um, okay. So in this one, sorry, how do I go back? Um, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't want to go anywhere. Okay, can I use this here? Okay. Um, so here, this is, uh, so in this case, this is the covariance. So it's just the power spectrum of, of halo uh, stochasticity. But in the case of the power spectrum likelihood, unfortunately, I don't have the covariance written here. But I can show you later. We have this in, in the paper, and I can show you how we dis derive this because it's a uh, it's a new thing. Uh, it's a bit uh, unusual. Great. I'll approach. find you tomorrow. Thanks. Okay. Other questions from the other? Oh, nice. Uh, for the power spectrum errors that you're comparing to, is this pre or post reconstruction? I, I, I'm sorry, I, can you repeat um, the question? When you're comparing uh, the errors from the, the field level to the power spectrum, are the power spectrum errors from pre or post reconstruction? So uh, they're, in a sense, they're post reconstruction because we are, uh, like the theoretical input is the one from the forward model, right? And forward model naturally, uh, natural part of it is this uh, uh, let's say it reconstruction because I mean the way it works, but we didn't perform any additional reconstruction in the sense of some kind of a backward uh, modeling that people usually uh, apply to the power spectrum. So it's the same information that goes into the EFT likelihood and the power spectrum likelihood. Uh, 
Um, this parameter beta that you introduced, that's effectively rescaling the sound horizon. Is that right? Um, yeah, exactly. Were you sort of trying to see whether you would recover that with your likelihood? What, what uh, yes, yes, we were trying to see how, how close to one we will be. So uh, closer beta is to one, less uh, biased our likelihood is, right? Because it, then it's uh, reconstructing yeah. uh, the, uh, it's recovering the fiducial value of the BAO scale size. Okay, thanks. Questions from Zoom? No. Okay. okay. So thank you again. <laughs> Next speaker is uh, Marina Silvia Cagliari. And oh, wait, what's happening here? <laughs> Okay. So, uh, hello, I'm Marina Cagliari, a PhD student at the University of Milan, and my talk is going to be about uh, augmenting redshift information in large cosmological surveys. So, uh, redshift can be measured in two different ways, with uh, spectroscopy, which is the more direct way to do it, or uh, with uh, photometry, uh, in, uh, in this case, uh, you only are able to locate uh, broadly some characteristic feature of uh, your spectra. Uh, spectros photometric redshift are much less precise than uh, spectroscopic one, uh, and they are also prone to some uh, degeneracies, as you can see here. However, they can go much deeper than uh, spectroscopy, and they can be acquired uh, faster. So, uh, what we've been trying to do is to augment the photometric data uh, using uh, ancillary uh, spectroscopic information. And we, uh, we are working on uh, two different methods to do so. The first one uh, is to be applied to slit rate spectroscopy survey, as uh, Euclid can, uh, will be. Uh, and uh, actually, I used the mock galaxy catalog from Euclid for the results I'm going to show later. In a uh, slit rate spectroscopy survey, the instrument uh, is going uh, to obtain uh, a spectra for all the objects in the field of view, as you can see from this image. However, the majority of the spectra will have a very low signal-to-noise ratio, and so we will not be able to actually obtain a redshift from them. So what we've been, we've been trying to do is to um, uh, actually uh, extract some information from uh, the spectra that otherwise would have been uh, wasted. So in order to do so, uh, we've used the ensemble photometric redshift method, uh, which aims uh, at constraining the redshift distribution of our overall uh, group of galaxies, which have been uh, previously uh, selected in uh, photometry, using the stacked spectrum, which is uh, basically the average of uh, the spectra of all the galaxies in uh, the selected color group. Here, on uh, the right, you can see uh, the plot of uh, three different uh, spectra at three different redshifts, and uh, being the stacked spectrum, uh, um, a linear combination of them, it will uh, retain information uh, of, the, uh, of the overall uh, redshift distribution of uh, these uh, galaxies. And uh, moreover, being uh, the average, it will uh, have uh, a smaller uh, air, uh, noise uh, in, uh, in, this power, in the stacked spectrum than uh, the single spectra. So let's see some uh, results from this method. Uh, on the left side, uh, you can see uh, the results from the more ideal case, where you can see that the redshift uh, distribution is fitted uh, with much detail, even its uh, substructure. While in the realistic case, um, we can see that the distribution is now very noisy, uh, but we are still able to locate its position, its width, uh, and uh, broadly uh, understand its uh, major peaks, uh, which is um, at least uh, some results, let's say. Uh, the other method uh, I'm briefly going to talk about uh, is uh, meant to be applied to uh, parent sample of uh, spectroscopic surveys. In this case, uh, um, we are using uh, the VIPERS uh, survey. And uh, here you can see uh, an exam a simulation of one of the field of view of VIPERS. The red dots are the galaxy from which uh, we only have uh, photometric information of the parent sample, while uh, the black one are the galaxy for which uh, a spectra was uh, actually acquired. And as you can see, uh, they are not much, they are about uh, 35%. So what we wanted to do was to try to um, increase, uh, augment the information in the photometric data 
uh, exploiting uh, the special correlation of galaxy, in particular of the galaxy in the spectroscopic sample and the photometric one. Uh, so if we imagine that we are on the surface of the sky, we have a galaxy here, the black one, of which we only have uh, photometric information, and then it has uh, some uh, neighbors uh, which has uh, uh, spectroscopic information. Uh, it is very probable that at least one of these neighbors will also be a neighbor in uh, Rashi space, so it's uh, really correlated to this galaxy. So what we've been working on is a graph neural network, a machine learning algorithm which uh, we've been training and testing on the spectroscopic sample of, uh, uh, of Vipers, that given a pair of galaxy, it will classify it as a real, a real neighbor, so true neighbors or a false neighbor. Then given uh, this information, uh, we uh, can do many things with this information, basically. One of which, uh, uh, which uh, is uh, to try to measure the redshift uh, of the uh, galaxies. Uh, and uh, here we decided a very simple way to do it. So given a photometric galaxy, we'll say that its uh, spectroscopic redshift is uh, equal, is, is, sorry, is redshift, sorry, is equal to the spectroscopic redshift of the, its more probable neighbor identified by the graph neural network. Here you can see the result from the network compared with the result of a more standard method to measure photometric redshifts. Um, and uh, as you can see, the first thing that one can notice is this very prominent straight line in uh, this uh, plot, which is, and these are the objects which are uh, really correlated, uh, especially correlated, while this spread is, uh, well, typical for uh, photometric redshifts, uh, but is smaller than the one one, one would get uh, with the uh, standard method of uh, photometric redshifts. Uh, then, uh, finally, we also computed the outlier fraction, which are the objects which are far from uh, the distribution, uh, which, which is here in the center. And uh, the, the graph neural network uh, almost half and the number of uh, outliers one would get with standard methods. And, uh, yeah. And uh, finally, the last thing we notice is that uh, the graph uh, actually has uh, a slightly biased, uh, gives a slightly biased uh, results, uh, which is something that, uh, on which we are currently working to try to impro improve uh, and uh, resolve. So uh, thank you for your attention. Questions from the audience? Oh, great work, very impressive. Um, have you uh, considered or tried using more than uh, three galaxies for well, a Yeah, sure, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we are, uh, this was uh, an example, just to make it clear what uh, is happening, but actually for the network we start with, uh, we select 30 neighbors, and then uh, we, from them uh, we uh, try to find which is uh, the more probable one uh, to be the real neighbor of the galaxy. So uh, it also depends on the uh, um, depth of the survey. So if uh, we are, uh, for example, actually Vipers uh, have the objects which are also at the redshift higher than one and also some uh, higher than two. Uh, here I'm not showing them, but uh, in that case uh, you wouldn't expect that any one of the angular neighbor is actually a real neighbor. So uh, we want the network to understand that as well. Can I ask one more question? There is... oh. um, in the correlation plot you showed, it looked like at the galaxy that have very high measured spectroscopic redshift tend to be more likely to be underestimated by your yeah, approach. Yeah, in fact, is there is a... a reasoning for it? Like, do you have any idea why the bias goes in that direction? Uh, we are still discussing about that uh, because this is a work in progress, but we think that uh, it may be some uh, volume effect uh, which uh, make it select a uh, uh, galaxy at the lower ratio than the uh, higher. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, I was wondering, uh, because you mentioned that you're uh, using the uh, angular separation, but I was wondering if you're using any other features uh, as uh, inputs to your neural network. Uh, yeah, sure. The uh, feature that uh, the networks get uh, is a gra graph neural networks. So uh, we give uh, a graph, which is uh, the most simple graph ever. So it's uh, two nodes, one of each galaxy. And the feature of uh, each one of these nodes is uh, for the galaxy with the spectroscopy, the spectroscopic redshift. And then uh, the other feature are the same, which are the magnitudes in the filters that we have and uh, the angular position. Thanks. Questions on Zoom? OK. Thanks again, then. Next speaker is Stephanie Brackenhoff. Is this okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay, hi. So my name is Stephanie Brakenhoff. I'm a PhD student at the Kaptein Astronomical Institute in the Netherlands. And uh, today I want to introduce you to some of the state-of-the-art observational challenges that we face when we're trying to provide observations to constrain models for reionization. So essentially uh, what Eleonora talked about with the tomography, um, this is kind of the uh, observational side of that and the challenges that we are facing. So the instrument that we are using is a low frequency array, LOFAR. And what we're trying to do is uh, observe the 21 centimeter signal uh, originating from the Epoch of Reionization and Cosmic Dawn. And uh, as you all know, this is a very, very high redshift signal. Uh, whereas if I take a picture with LOFAR, it looks a little bit like this, where I have a lot of bright foreground sources in a way uh, that yeah, dominates over my power spectrum. So what we try to do is we try to uh, analyze all the different contaminants and remove them, and then we get something that looks like this. It's a lot cleaner, a lot of the power has been removed, but we still have a lot of things that are brighter than both the 21 centimeter signal and the thermal noise. So we can just integrate more data to get a better estimate of the 21 centimeter power. So we get stuck with this kind of weird problem where we have an amazing instrument. LOFAR is really one of the top radio telescopes that are currently operational. We have a lot of data. We have over 3,000 hours currently on disk ready to be analyzed. But we cannot get to the signal that we're trying to observe because there is simply this excess power which we don't understand. So um, what we are trying to do right now is to make forward models of these excess power sources and to try to uh, figure out which one is actually the dominant one that is, uh, yeah, that is the one that's making sure that we can't reach that signal that we're interested in. And the one I am currently interested in is the ionosphere, so that's what I'll be talking about. But first, let's take a quick look at uh, what we're actually doing here. This is a timeline of the early universe, and what we're interested in is this epoch ranging from the dark ages kind of until reionization is complete. And ideally, uh, we would like to do tomography, where we fully know where all the neutral hydrogen is as a function of redshift. Now, SKA might be able to do this a little bit, but with the current generation of uh, instrument, that's just not possible. So what people do instead is two different things. First of all, you can look at the sky averaged global signal. But what my group is doing is looking at the spatial fluctuations using the power spectrum. And we are doing that using uh, instruments called LOFAR and NANUFAR. And the redshift ranges that LOFAR and NANUFAR are able to reach uh, are shown here in this plot. Um, and as you can see, we do not cover the full redshift range that we're interested in, but if we are able to probe down to the 21 centimeter signal in this range, we'll be able to uh, really meaningfully constrain uh, the process of reionization a lot better. 
Uh, but as I said, unfortunately, we're currently not right there because uh, finding this uh, very high redshift signal is a bit like finding a needle in a haystack. There are many different contaminants. Um, like I already said, we have astrophysical foregrounds that are like 10 to the power of 5 brighter than the signal we're interested in. That problem is made a lot worse by the ionosphere. There is radio frequency interference, both man-made and natural. There are instrumental imperfections. If we don't watch out, we introduce extra errors with our calibration pipeline. In other words, there are a lot of issues. Uh, and we need to separate these issues. And the one I am looking into is the ionosphere. The ionosphere is this turbulent ionized layer in the top of the Earth's atmosphere. And it causes phase shifts to incoming radiation. So our incoming wave front is distorted and we cannot properly image anymore. So if I have a, an array that is trying to... Oh, I try to make a pointer, but... <laughs> if I have an array that is looking at that, I can have uh, two, different care, uh, two different kinds of pairs of antennas. I can have this on the left, two antennas close together, that's a short baseline, or this thing on the right, where I have two antennas far apart, that's a long baseline. Now, a long baseline probes uh, large distances in the atmosphere uh, because the pierce points are far apart. And that means, if you look a bit at like, what this screen looks like, that I will get a larger phase variance. So, in that way, a long baseline has worse effects. However, I'm also trying to calibrate as I'm observing, and it takes quite a while for the ionosphere to move over such a long baseline. So, I have a longer correlation time to solve for these arrows. Uh, errors that are introduced. And also, I can calibrate my long baselines better on bright point sources. So on the one hand, I have a lot more trouble with a long baseline, but I can also solve for it much better. And that introduces kind of a weird effect uh, in relation to baseline length. And also, we treat different baselines very differently in our calibration strategy. So we currently have no analytical way to compute the effects of the ionosphere, which is why we're doing forward simulations. Now, this is the result of a very simple uh, forward simulation where I just have a few foreground sources and some thermal noise. And um, here on the, uh, on the left, that's all that's in there. And on the right, I have also distorted my signal with an ionosphere. And here I'm plotting the power divided by the power of uh, thermal noise realization. So what I want is this plot to be kind of white, kind of dancing around the white values, because then the thermal noise is dominating, and I can integrate more data to get lower in power, to really probe down to where I want to be in sensitivity. Um, if I only have thermal noise and foregrounds, I am able to do this very well. But uh, if I also have an ionosphere, then in the bottom right part of this plot, we see a lot of uh, excess power showing up. And that is also what we see in real data. This is an actual uh, upper limit published uh, by our group, where you see that there's also more purple in the bottom of this plot. So that is also where we see this excess variance. Um, and this is an indicator that this ionospheric noise can really be uh, one of the dominant sources. However, uh, this is still very preliminary. We need uh, to make the models that we're using a lot more realistic to really say something sensible about this. Uh, but I just wanted to introduce you uh, yeah, to what we're doing here. So that brings me to my take home message. I didn't start the talk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm exactly at seven minutes right now. <laughs> no, I'm, uh, I had my own timer. Um, <laughs> which is that uh, estimating the 21 uh, centimeter spectrum from the Epoch of Reionization and Cosmic Dawn is right now very difficult. Um, and that is basically because the exact effects of the different contaminants that we're dealing with are not fully analyzed. So we need forward simulations of these effects and the ionosphere might be one piece of this puzzle. Thank you for your attention. You said it exactly at seven minutes. That <laughs> <laughs> so questions from the audience? Okay. Can you go back to the slide where you're showing the power? Okay. Uh, this one? Yeah, this one and the next one as well? Yeah, okay, both. Yeah. This one? Uh, yeah, I guess my simple question, I know nothing about the ionosphere, so I just want, you mentioned that the ionosphere varies over a long time scale on these, on the length, on the long baseline length. Oh, right? yeah, that's, uh, I have a longer time scale. Longer yes. time. What is that time scale? Like, um, how long? 
Um, so for a short baseline, it's really in the order of a few seconds. Um, and for a longer baseline, it can be several minutes. It really depends on the weather. Um, the, the worst observations we just throw away because it's impossible to, to calibrate. Uh, but on a really good night, you might have like 20 minutes even, uh, which is good. Um, but especially on the short baselines, uh, we are not able to, to do the sor source subtraction in the way that we would like to uh, for the short baselines. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, so why do you have uh, an excess of power in the lower part of the power spectrum? Uh, yeah, thanks for your question. I think you mean uh, this slide? Yeah. Yeah, so um, this is basically because the main effect of the ionosphere that we see is that the foreground sources are uh, broken up and smeared out, which makes them more difficult to subtract. And typically, uh, these foreground sources are very spectrally smooth, which means that they end up at uh, low k parallel val uh, values. So spectrally smooth is in the bottom of this plot, which is where we get the foregrounds. Thank you. Um, it looks like in the with with the atmosphere, it looks like you have um, more noise towards the smaller scales in the transverse direction, or is it just just me? <laughs> uh, so towards this, you mean kind of um, wait in this area? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is uh, actually something we expect. So I have a bunch of yeah. Um, this is uh, because um, if I have a baseline and I travel to uh, a different frequency, it kind of gets shifted. Uh, so th these different colors are just the same pair of antennas, but how they travel through K-space. Um, so this is just an instrumental effect that kind of wedges um, uh, co low K parallel modes up a bit uh, at high K perpendicular modes. So it has nothing to do with the ionosphere, the source of the... Of it the also has to do with the ionosphere, um, but it is in general something you observe with foreground, uh, with excess foreground power. Um, and the ionosphere just makes this foreground power worse because we're not able to, to piece the foreground sources together to properly subtract them. Right, Does thanks. that answer your question? Uh, yeah, more or less. Okay. <laughs> Questions on Zoom? No. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. So, last but not, le but not least, Iago Mergulhau will conclude the second session of uh, Student Talks. No, I mean, you can, you can turn it off. <laughs> Hi. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Right. Uh, here. Here. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So hi everyone. I'm Tiago Mergulhão. I'm a first year PhD student at the University of Edinburgh, working with Florian Beutler and John Peacock. But today I'd like to share with you some results I got when I was in my master's. The, the project's called the Factory Theory of Hospital Structure and Multitracer. I'm just going to show some results, but if you want more details, the reference is just out there. So just a brief introduction. Uh, as you saw in the, in the summer school, we have the lambda CDM model. We basically learn how to evolve all the primordial seeds for inflation until the evolved dark matter field. But when we look to the sky, we see galaxies. And one of the main goals of Waskia structure is how can you constrain, I can use that thing. How can you, second? Yeah, how can you constrain our theory given that the data looks like this? That's basically one of, one of the main goals of, of classical structure. And knowing that it's really important, we basically ask ourselves the following question. How can we optimize the information we extract from classical structure? And there are many different models in the, in the literature. You can basically have many different approaches. But two of, the, two of that 
two, uh, two of these approaches that are really famous are the multi-trace approach and perturbation theory approach. Well, the perturbation theory approach, as so in the lectures, it basically gives you the power to predict what's going on in small scales. So it basically allows you to include that modes in your analysis so you can unlock the information happening in short scales. The multi-tracer, I think it's new. If, if, if it's new for you, just, just let me give you a brief introduction. When you look to the sky, you see galaxies, okay? But it happens that we have many different types of galaxies. So we have basically two different approaches. You can have the single trace approach, where you look to the galaxies and treat them as being the same, or you look to the galaxies and say, wait a minute, these galaxies are actually a really bit different. Some galaxies are blue, some, some galaxies are red. What if I treat them separately? That's basically the multi-trace mindset. And there is a well-known result that we in some, uh, some conditions. When you do the multi-trace approach, we can basically boost all the information extracted from the large scales. So on one hand, we have the multi-tracer, which improves the, the constraint from large scales. And we have perturbation theory that improves the constraint from, from small scales. And now you probably know what, what you did, right? So why don't you put the both together and have both at the same time? That's basically a motivation, OK? Yeah, so let me explain briefly uh, how did you do that. So I need to basically go to that, that uh, picture again. And that pen on the top are basically uh, galaxies. Each one is a galaxy on the top and the left. And here on the right and the bottom are simulations of the dark matter field. And it's a really complicated model to, to connect the galaxy field with the matter field. But you should expect that they are connected. Imagine the following. Imagine you have a, a region in space that has a lot of dark matter. This region is going to attract a lot of more dark matter and also baryonic uh, stuff. It means that in that region, trace formation is boosted. So you should expect that kind of interplay between galaxies and, and, and tracers. And over history, people, over the last decades, people tried to make all kind of, what? Oh, I think that there is something missing here. Yeah, my slides were not like that. Really. <laughs> yes, I do have my laptop. Can I, can I get it? Yes, no, I have an adapter here. Oh, yeah, but in that case, I'll not be able to use that. But yeah, anyway. Yes. Oh, was it was it like that? Yes, I'm doing it right now. Recording in progress. Got it. Uh, share screen, desktop one. Let me close my WhatsApp so people don't bother me. Is it working? Perfect. Uh, okay. Yes, precisely. How do I do full screen here? I don't know. Oh my gosh. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, view full screen. Last step, last step. Oh, yeah, into full screen. Oh, excellent. So I think I was here, right? Yeah, so oh, I need to remove my sound. And also to mute myself. Oh, I should have removed this? No, no. no I mute myself here in. Yeah. Ah, okay, excellent. I think it's fine now. Yeah. For the pointer, you can use the this one, this one, Ah, but I can, but I can use here, right? You can use your pointer in. Ah, in the computer. Ah, excellent. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Okay, excellent. So I was talking about, yes, how to connect the tracer field with the galaxy field. The galaxy field with the meta field. And 
uh, yeah, so there are these really dense regions that attract even more matter with time and better stuff, so you should expect that there is this kind of connection between galaxies and uh, the matter field. And over the last decades, people have been trying to figure it out what this, how this connection occurs. In the beginning, people simply use like very simple relations like, you basically say, oh, there is a linear response in large scales. It's basically a constant factor between them. And then they start to complicate, complicate, complicate until the perturbation theory were developed. And now we have a systematic way to figure out what all kind of operators that are relevant to the, to the tracer field up to, some, up to some order in perturbation theory. What is really good is that the set of operators you need are fixed given to, up to some order in perturbation theory. What is great. So I'm not going to, to the details of the calculations, but I really refer you to that seminal paper by Asasi. And in this, in this talk, I'll basically be concerned about the power spectrum, which is the two function function. And here on the bottom, I'll show basically what it looks like. Uh, the, the blue bots are the datas, and the different lines are the nonlinear, are the contributions of all data operators that appear here. Remember that for the power spectrum, basically multiply two different delta Gs, and then take the ensemble average. And then when you do this, you have many different contributions. And all of that sum up to give you a description about how galaxies uh, are clustering, okay? And how do we put multi-trace on that? Well, we have the result for single trace. And if you assume that the single trace, one of the traces doesn't care too much about the other tracer, you can simply apply your result twice. So you basically assume that the same bias expansion you have for one tracer, you have for the other trace as well. So in that case, you have these, these red galaxies and the orange galaxies. So you basically allow each tracer to have its own set of bias parameters. Okay. And then in the single tracer case, we have basically four different, four degrees of freedom in the effective theory. But in the multi tracer case, you have two S's more. And the question is, which case is going to perform more in describing the, the physics that's happened and also to recover all the, bio, all the cosmological parameters? And when you do the calculations, we were a bit shocked. But in that plot, I don't know if you can see you well. Yeah, I think you can. Uh, the red lines are the result for the single tracer, and the blue line are the result for the multi tracer. It seems that the multi-tracer results uh, outperform the single-tracer results, not only on the bias parameters, but also on the cosmological parameters, especially on H and omega CDM. And it's a really good improvement, right? And the question we ask ourselves is why? Why is it happening? What, 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 why? And there notice something. Wait a minute. Different traces of the, of the, of the elastic structure, they uh, populate different elastic structure environments. Each tracer has its own tracer formation history. There are different things, even different astrophysical things. So they should be treated differently. So we expect that different tracers has different nonlinear responses to the large scale structure dynamics. Even the perturbation theory tells you that because it's possible to write some sort of bias coevolution relations. I'm not going to the details again, but you basically can fix many of the, uh, of the EFT coefficients with respect to the linear bias, and it tells you that traces with different linear bias are going to have different tidal fields. They're, they're, they're going to depend to the tidal field in a different way. And, all the other, and it also, it's also valid for all the other operators. When you did this and you split the, the superpopulations, we saw this happening. It's basically a correlation matrix for the, for the data. In the left, I have the single tracer case. On the right, I have the multi tracer case. I can see that by splitting the, 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 the population two, the, these two traces accommodate way better the nonlinear information than the single tracer case. But now that you know that, even the theory tells you that it's supposed to happen. It makes sense, right? When you treat them together, you're basically smearing out or taking an average about the nonlinear response of two totally different objects. That's basically the takeaway message from, from, my, from my presentation. And uh, just for, to conclude, uh, multi-trace is better than single tracer when it comes to perform a full shape analysis of the power spectrum. I forgot to say something on real space. All these results are for real space. The multi-trace is useful to break degeneracy between bias parameters because they have different nonlinear responses to the LSS dynamics. And also, the information for small scales is better translated into, into separated trace bias. And yeah, that's, that's basically what I had to, 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 to talk about today. Thank you. Oh. Uh, just a small comment I forgot to say. Hey, right now, we are, it's a work in progress. The following up work is to basically put all that in redshift space distortion. And we have this preliminary result where we have like the multiples for two different tracers. And it's, it seems to be working really well. And it's a collaboration with Enrico Rubira, Rodrigo Vojvodic, Florian Beutler, and John Peacock. 
So thank you. Okay. <laughs> the questions? Any question from the audience? No. Left out from Zoom. You have a question? Where? Uh, excuse me. Just one. Uh, as you said, uh, when uh, we have a collection of mass, for example, somewhere, uh, you are dividing several types of masses that have uh, several kinds of redshifts, for example. Am I right? Sorry, are you saying, are you saying that each trace would be in different redshift? Yeah, how do you divide those? Ah, excellent, excellent. There, there is no answer for that question, I suppose, to how, what's the best way to divide them. In that case, I was, I was working with the dark matter halos. And for dark matter halos, you know that their masses are really important. Because the mass is related with the linear bias, and the linear bias can be related to BK2, so everything comes traced back to the mass. So for halos, it's easy to find what's the, what's the physical property that is really relevant. For galaxies, it's not that obvious, but what people usually do is to use uh, red galaxies and blue galaxies, allergies and ERGs e e e uh, for the boys, for instance. Um, are these tracers related to each other? What do you mean by related? Is there any correlation between these? Separate? No, yes, 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 perfect, yes. As I showed there, when you, when you split the populations, you need to take, into, to take into account the out-correlation between them and also the cross-correlation between the two. And there is a cross-correlation, as you can see there, for the, all the, 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 the line, ah, I think I can use that. Like, for instance, this one is the cross plus spectrum. This one is another boss plus spectrum, and so on. So yes, there is a cross-correlation between them. Thank you. Other questions? You had a question, right? No? No. Okay. So, thanks again. <laughs> and thanks again to all the students who have uh, presented uh, their presentations today. <laughs>